Hello, party people, and welcome to Office Hours, the webcast where you can ask me whatever you want about SQL Server over at PullGab. The link is in the description. Uh, and then whatever y'all upvote the most, that's what I go and cover in the webcast. So in this one, uh, let's go through and start answering. Oh, you'll probably hear voices in the background too. I'm, I'm down in Cabo and there's a skimboarding competition uh, happening out on the beach. Today happens to be the finals. So every now and then you'll hear some cheering going on out there. The SQL Crooner asks, what are the telltale signs that your SQL server has been granted too much memory and the OS not enough? So there's a perfmon counter called target memory. Generally speaking, target should be the same thing as max. Target is how much memory SQL Server is willing to use, and you want that to be the same thing as max. If you want SQL Server to use this much, SQL Server should be willing to use this much. But when target drifts lower, that means that something else is putting SQL Server under memory pressure, or is really putting the box under memory pressure by grabbing additional memory. So the ways that you can fix that are, you can lower SQL Server's max memory, it's a totally legit solution. You can put more memory in the box. You can go investigate which application is using so much memory and tune that to get it to run less or have it run on a different server. The reason you might want to lower max memory is that when target is lowered because something else is grabbing more memory, SQL Server will shed things like a, a balloonist that's trying to throw things out of the basket in order to maintain altitude. The stuff that it throws out the basket may not be the things that you wish it would throw out of the basket. It's kind of an uncontrolled dump and you can lose things that you really care about. So if you leave max at a lower amount so that it lets that other application or the operating system grab whatever memory it needs, SQL Server seems to do a better job of memory management when target can be predictable. Next up, Gulnaz asks, is select star okay or discouraged when used with if not exists? SQL Server optimizes it away when you see if not exists, so it doesn't matter whether you type uh, if exists select star or if exists select top one, and you can go test that yourself to see the differences in the execution plans, logical reads, and so forth. Some people who have nothing better to do with their lives will say, you know, you still shouldn't use select star, even though it doesn't matter, it's just a bad habit. And I always kind of want to ask those people about their other bad habits because it seems like they're not really brushing their teeth as often as they should or maybe they're not exercising as much as they should or they're not getting the minimum required uh, amount of vegetables per day. It's easy to sit in an ivory tower and go, you should just never type those things. But if it makes no difference in terms of performance, pick your battles. Pick the battles that really matter so that when you give someone advice, they'll actually take it instead of them saying, well, that, that advice doesn't really matter. Next up, we have Shingen who asks, is table partitioning largely unnecessary? Yes. I, I really don't need to read any beyond that, but in most cases, the answer is yes. Shingen continues, since modern storage can move data to hot or cold storage tiers, that was never really what partitioning was about. Partitioning is about a maintenance feature that makes it easier to swap in a partition or drop an entire partition, like when you're loading data or deleting large amounts of data. So if you're truly using partitioning for that use case where you're doing sliding window loads, then the storage's ability to move things to hot or cold doesn't really affect anything. And most people just don't need partitioning is what that comes down to. SP Azure SQL asks, Hi Brent, what is the best cutover strategy in production migration scenarios from a SQL Server availability group to Azure SQL in terms of blocking the incoming traffic, like disabling logins? I'll give you just a little tip. Whenever you ask questions, try to edit out any words that don't matter. Like in this case, what you're asking, it doesn't matter if you're doing Azure or SQL. What you're really asking is, how can I stop people from changing data? 
Because during a migration, what you're worried about is you're worried about someone logging in and changing something about the data or seeing inaccurate data. Uh, in that case, I don't even bother screwing around with logins. My goal here is to set the database read only, then do whatever tail of the log backups that I need to do before I go live over on the other server. You can also put the database in single user mode if that's your fancy. You can uh, rename the database is another one of my favorite tricks. Um, but I don't, I don't really like uh, relying on turning off logins because sometimes they still need access to specific databases but not others or uh, changing their passwords en masse or disabling their logins causes a problem because then they start calling for support regardless. They're like, I can't get in and my application is failing. And I'm like, yeah, that's because we're having an outage. Um, so renaming a server is another trick like changing the DNS aliases. Um, Turner Burn asks, my company moved a database from a physical box to a VM. The, the server has fewer cores, but processing is better and memory is the same. I now see many more deadlocks reported from SP Blitz lock on the VM versus the physical box. So what it sounds like is you changed all SQL Server 2016. You changed all kinds of things inside here. So what I would really say is forget comparing the old system to the new system. Just go start investigating the deadlocks. Start investigating the deadlocks. And my favorite way to do that is with SP Blitz lock. SP Blitz Lock returns two result sets. The first one has the list of itemized deadlocks. That's not the one you want. Skip down to the second result set and it gives you like a slice and dice business intelligence interface on your deadlocks. What you're looking for is the thing that most of your deadlocks have in common. And maybe it's a statement that wasn't being run before. Maybe it's an application that wasn't being run before. You've changed so many things that I think that looking for everything that's different is kind of wasting your time. And what you just need to do instead is start troubleshooting deadlocks as if you've never had them before. Forget the old system. What is that noise? Sounds like there's a whole wagon full of gravel going around across here. I'm hoping that in any second it stops. Now would be a nice time to take a sip of my tasty beverage. Just every time it tapers off, I'm like, okay, is it done? Yeah, I think it's done. Next up, we have Gnome who asks, on a scale of one to 10, how would you write the SQL Server documentation versus the Postgres documentation? Oh, um, I really like the SQL Server documentation. Um, and I, I kind of always have because uh, with every page, Microsoft has had a really good track record of putting the explanations at the top and the examples at the bottom on the same page. So you can always go get working examples to copy paste from and use as a starting point. If I was to tweak one thing about that, I'd say maybe put one working code snippet up at the top, just you know the thing that people look at the most common, so they have perspective as they're reading the documentation. But I, I really love the SQL Server documentation, especially as fast as the product keeps changing. Um, it, I also love that it's on GitHub now, so when I find inaccuracies, which is pretty unusual, uh, when I find inaccuracies, I can submit a pull request and then it gets ignored, but at least I can submit it, which makes me feel a little bit better. Uh, Postgres documentation, this is such a good example of how Google SEO makes all the difference in the world. When I search for help with things with Postgres, I almost never hit the official documentation. I almost always hit things like Stack Exchange, which that right there is probably an answer as to the usefulness of Postgres's documentation for me. It's just way lower. It's not as valu valuable as uh, Stack Exchange. Next up, Peter asks, what is your opinion of the DP900 Azure Data Fundamentals certification? I haven't taken a certification in probably 10 years, uh, so I'm not a great person to answer. Um, as far as I know, the people I know who take these tests, who I respect, uh, don't... 
I'll, I'll just leave it as I, I wouldn't want to violate anybody's opinion like that and make it obvious it's something that somebody told me in confidence. Um, so I, I'm not that impressed with the certification still that they don't line up with what people have to do in the real world. It feels like they're more marketing based where Microsoft wants to teach you the things that Azure has, that they're training you to become an evangelist. It's like, here, let us show you the features of the Hammer 9000 so that whenever you see a nail or anything that looks like a nail or a screw or a lever, you can get out the new Azure Hammer 9000 and beat the daylights out of it. And I'm like, I, I don't think you really want to teach people about tools. You want to teach the people about the problems that they're facing and when to reach for the right tool. Uh, so that's just me. Next up, uh, we have QEnt. QEnt says, hi Brent, is there any scenario where enabling RCSI on a database that uses the default isolation level to turn your data into trash? Yes. Um, I've hit this with a couple of clients and I've been meaning to write a blog post uh, about it. But it basically involves around locking situations where the default isolation level would have led to a blocking lock and RCSI no longer uh, requires a blocking lock. So it lets more people get in simultaneously. At some point here, I'll write a blog post about that. It's beyond what I can show without a, a back and forth uh, going into Management Studio with demos though. Prohiller says, hi, can we somehow predict percent decrease of overall CPU usage on a server when optimizing a query? Given that we know the CPU time of the current and optimization, da, 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 da. yeah, yeah, so what you first have to fill, figure out is what percentage of the server's CPU usage is driven by that one query. Um, classic example, I was dealing with a client who ran a query, you know, like a thousand times a second. And when you added up the CPU times, it was basically monopolizing four of their CPU cores. And I said, if we make this change, I can cut CPU usage by 50%, which means that instead of this query using four CPU cores all the time, it's going to use two CPU cores all the time. Now, the, the problem is that a query has to be run a whole lot or it has to suck really bad to add up to that much CPU usage. But you're on exactly the right track. The number of times that the query was called, how much CPU usage it uses each time, and then how much the new modified version will use. My friend the DBA asks, I have a table with 450 million rows on a production server. What's the least disruptive way to index this table? Often when I see uh, 450 million rows, it's more of either like a data warehousing thing where you're going to keep uh, the history around for forever and you want to run like analytical type queries. You should probably check out column store if it's an analytical type of uh, table where people are grouping data across ranges, like show me the sales data by month, by year, by product range. Um, it's fairly unusual that I see transactional tables, payroll records, uh, uh, clock ins, clock outs, product sales that hit half a billion rows. And when they do, it's because people aren't getting good about archiving and you want to start peeling off the, the rows that don't matter, putting those into more archive based storage, things that are only used in reporting systems. Uh, having said that, uh, you asked what the most efficient ways of indexing it are. With a table with 450 billion rows, most of the time, it's mostly read-only. Like, you're only changing so much percentage of it a day. So, the indexing doesn't really matter that much. You can index the bejesus out of it when the vast majority of it is read-only. Your only concern at that point is storage space utilized. And just because something has 450 million rows doesn't mean it takes up a lot of space. For example, you look in Stack Overflow at the current votes table in the Stack Overflow data dumps. It's got like 200 million rows, but because there are very few columns and they're all integers or dates, it only takes up like 10 gigabytes worth of space. And so you can index the bejesus out of that and it only still takes up like 30, 40 gigabytes worth of space. It's just not that big of a deal. Now I, 
to some of us in the audience, 30, 40, 50 gigabytes is a big deal. Sure, absolutely. But remember, we're keeping in perspective here, we're talking about a quarter billion row table. And at that point, it's, it's not really that bad. Whereas on the flip side, you can have tables that have way less rows, but because people had a, a sale on columns and everything must go, they decided to throw every possible column in there. That even just 100 million rows can mean huge, massive data. Uh, Yoshia asks, what is your opinion of Azure Synapse? I have no opinion on it whatsoever. I've never used it. SQL Crooner finishes up by asking, what are your top SQL best practices that you wish more clients would follow? You know, I teach whole classes about that. And I'm always kind of amazed uh, that people who've been doing SQL Server work for a really long period of time say, I've got 10 years worth of experience. I only need blog posts in order to keep up. And I'm like, when was the last time you went to a training class? You know, when was the last time you sat and learned for three days straight? You know, like, well, I don't need to do need to do that. Okay, go back through the last three versions of SQL Server and look at the What's New page. And there have been a stunning amount of things added to SQL Server 2016, 17, and 19. If you're not going to training and keeping your skills sharp, the best practices that were in play 10 years ago are no longer in place now. You know, I look at people who still look at page life expectancy or uh, think that 100 million rows is a big deal, or uh, they look at queues. I'm like, oh, none of that stuff really matters anymore. We have better ways of doing performance tuning. So if I guess I had to sum it up with one thing, the best practice that I wish more clients would follow is go to training before you need it. You know, go to training to keep your skills sharp. I kind of think of my client base, the, the group of people out there who pay me as like a Venn diagram. There's people who buy training and there's people who buy consultants. You're either going to buy training and be proactive or you're not going to buy training and you're going to buy consulting from me because your servers are on fire and you can't figure out why. I wish more people would be proactive because you can solve more problems way less expensively if you actually reach out and learn proactively about the problems your servers are facing. All right, there we go. That uh, wraps it up for the question queue. There are a couple of uh, professional development questions that I'm gonna go tackle totally separately in a longer webcast because uh, they deserve longer, more detailed results. But for now, I will uh, take a sip of my tasty beverage. I'm going to turn the chair the other way. And I am going to enjoy the views of the, the crashing waves myself. Uh, and I uh, hope that y'all enjoyed Office Hours and learned something. And I will see y'all next time. Adios.